Well, shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. And thank you, Hannah, for the beautiful music. That was amazing. Thank you, as always. So tonight, I am going to be reading the last half of the chapter that we started yesterday in Josephus. And of course, lots of comments that we have to, uh, that we have that we can respond to. And uh, also, of course, live uh, fellowship for those of you in the live chat. Feel free to drop your questions or prayer requests in the live chat. Uh, that'll be awesome. Yeah, lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. So uh, after Josephus, I do have some that I, and if I left a reply to your comment saying that I will answer your comment or your questions today, I'll do that again after the reading of Josephus. It'll probably, like where I am right now, it, it, it's... Uh, um, it's, it'll be about 8 p.m. Eastern by the time I get to the comments in the comment section. So it'll be about another, maybe, uh, maybe about another 20 minutes or so. So we'll read Josephus first. We'll get into the comments, your, your, um, uh, your questions and comments in the live chat. And also critical thinking, as always, at the end. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the appeal to popularity and also another critical thinking quiz at the end. All right, all right. So I pray that everything that we share here today would be a great blessing to you. Increase your knowledge of the scriptures, your knowledge of the things of heaven, your relationship with God, and your knowledge of the truth. Amen, amen, amen. See what we have here in the live chat just before we get into the thick of it. Soldier of Yahweh says, Shalom to all. Shalom, soldier of Yahweh. Welcome and blessings multiplied to you. By the way, one of the comments that you left it, one of the comments that you left on uh, the uh, one of my videos, uh, I think it was, what was it now? Just earlier today, I will be reading and responding to that after the reading of Josephus. Thank you, Soldier of Yahweh. And again, I notice you have another question here in, in the in the live chat. So I'm I'm gonna wait until the question Q and A time to take care of all that. I appreciate that, Soldier of Yahweh. Thank you. Shalom, blessings. And Kalamento says Shalom Dal. Shalom, Kalamentos. Welcome, blessings. Blessings multiplied to you. Flo says blessings, everyone. Thank you, Flo. Welcome and Shalom. Blessings multiplied back to you. You and yours. Flo says, I was thinking this is music night, but now I realize I have to wait one more day. Yeah, it'll be one more day. One more day. We're working on this uh, new song. By the way, we are, we are working on a new song called Hands to War. Those of you who are members, I did post an early access to the lyrics of that song. So those of you who are uh, Members, you can go to the community tab on my YouTube channel and you'll see the lyrics. You got, I got the whole lyrics there posted for you guys to read and enjoy and perhaps even follow along to tomorrow night. Awesome. Thank you, Flo. Randy says, Shalom. Shalom, Randy. Welcome and blessings multiplied to you. All right. Flo says, thank you, Hannah, for sharing your music with us. Always peaceful. Yes, it was beautiful, wasn't it? Thank you, Flo. You know, Hannah would appreciate that. Child of One True King says, Shalom, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Shalom, Child of One True King. Welcome. Blessings multiplied to you. And Child of One True King says, Thank you, Hannah. So thank you. Thank you. Seek the Lord says, Shalom, Shalom, seek the Lord. Welcome. And blessings, blessings multiplied to you. All right. Okay. So let's get into the reading for tonight. We're going to read Flavius Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews. Now I read the first half of the uh, of the chapter last night, so I'm going to read the last half tonight. Okay, so let's let's do this. We'll do this first, then we'll come back. And we'll get into the comment section and the live chat with you guys. Let's do this. Flavius Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, book 15, chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 7, paragraph 5. When Alexandra observed how things went and that there were small hopes that she herself could escape or should escape the like treatment from Herod, 
she changed her behavior to quite the reverse of what it might have been expected from her former boldness, and this after a very indecent manner. For out of her desire to show how entirely ignorant she was of the crimes laid against Miriam, she leaped out of her place and reproached her daughter in the hearing of all the people, cried out that she had been an ill woman and ungrateful to her husband, and that her punishment came justly upon her for such her insolent behavior, for that she had not made proper returns to him who had been their common benefactor. And when she had for some time acted after this hypocritical manner, and being so outrageous as to tear her hair, this indecent and dissembling behavior, as was to be expected, was greatly condemned by the rest of the spectators, and is, as it is, excuse me, as it was principally by the poor woman who was to suffer. For at the first, she gave she gave her not a word, nor was discom, discomposed at her peevishness, and only looked at her. Yet did she, out of a, out of a greatness of soul, discover her uh, concern for her mother's offense, and especially for her exposing herself in a manner so unbecoming her. But, as for herself, she went to her death with an unshaken firmness of mind, and without changing the color of her face, and thereby evidently discovered the nobility of her descent to the spectators, even in the last moments of her life. Paragraph 6. And thus died Miriam, a woman of an excellent character, both for chastity and greatness of soul, but she wanted moderation, and had too much of, of contention in her nature. Yet had she all that can be said in the beauty of her body, and her majestic appearance in conversation, and thence arose the greatest part of the of the occasions why she did not prove so agreeable to the king, nor live so pleasantly with him as she might otherwise have done, for a while she was most indulgently used by the king out of his fondness for her, and did not expect that he could do any hard thing to her. She took too unbounded she took too unbounded a liberty. Moreover, that which was afflicted her was what he had done to her by or done to her relations, and she ventured to speak of all they had suffered by him, and at last greatly provoked both the king's mother and sister till they became enemies to her, and even he himself also did the same on whom alone she depended for her expectations of escaping the last punishments. Paragraph 7. But when she was once dead, the king's affections for her were kindled in a more outrageous manner than before, whose old passion for her we have already described, for his love to her was not of a calm nature nor such as we usually meet with among other husbands, for at its commencement it was of an uh, enthusiastic kind, nor was it by their long cohabitation and free conversation together brought under his power to manage. But at this time his love to Miriam seized, or seemed to seize him in such a peculiar manner as looked like divine vengeance upon him for the taking away her life. For he would frequently call for her and frequently lament for her in a most indecent manner. Moreover, he bethought him of everything he could make use of to divert his mind from thinking of her and, contri and contrived feasts and assemblies for that purpose, but nothing would suffice. He therefore laid aside the administration of public affairs and was so far conquered by his passion 
that he would order his servants to call Miriam as if she were still alive and could still hear them. And when he was in this way, there arose a pestilential disease carried off the great, greatest part of the multitude and of his best and most esteemed friends and made all men suspect that this was brought upon them by the anger of God for the injustice that had been done to Miriam. This circumstance affected the king still more till at length he forced himself to go into desert places and there, under pretense of going a-hunting, bitterly afflicted himself. Yet had he not borne his grief there many days before he fell into a most dangerous distemper himself, he had an inflammation upon him and a pain in the hinder part of his head, joined with madness, and for the remedies that were used, they did him no good at all, but proved contrary to his case, and so at length brought him to despair. All the physicians also that were about him, partly because the medicines they brought for his recovery could not at all conquer the disease, and partly because his diet could be no more, excuse me, could be no other than what his disease inclined him to, desired him to eat whatever he had a mind to, and so left the small hopes they had of his recovery in the power of that diet and committed him to fortune. And thus did his distemper go on while he was at Samaria, now called Sebasti. Paragraph 8. Now Alexandra abode at this time at Jerusalem, and being informed what condition Herod was in, she endeavored to get possession of the fortified places that were about the city, which were two, and one belonging to the city itself, the other belonging to the temple, and those that could get them into their hands had the whole nation under their power. For without the command of them, it was not possible to offer their sacrifices, and to think of leaving on those sacrifices is to every Jew plainly impossible, who are still more ready to lose their lives than to leave off that divine worship which they have been wont to pay unto God. Alexandra, therefore, discoursed with those that had the keeping of these strongholds, that it was proper for them to deliver the same to her and to Herod's sons, lest upon his death any other person should seize upon the government, and that upon his recovery none could keep them more safely for him than those of his own family. These words were not by them at all taken in good part, and as they had been in former times faithful to Herod, they resolved to continue so more than ever, both because they hated Alexandra and because they thought it a sort of impiety to despair of Herod's recovery while he was yet alive. For they had been, they had been his old friends, and one of them, whose name was Achaebus, was his cousin dash German. They sent messengers, therefore, to acquaint him with Alexandra's design, so he made no longer delay, but gave orders to have her slain. Yet was it still with difficulty, and after he had endured great pain, that he got clear of his distemper. He was still sorely afflicted, both in mind and body, and made very uneasy, and readier than ever, upon all occasions, to inflict punishment upon those that fell under his hand. He also slew the most intimate of his friends, Castabarus, and Lysimachus, and Cadius, who was also called Antipater, as also Dacetheus, and that upon the following occasion. Paragraph 9. Castabarus was an Idumean by birth, and one of principal dignity among them, and one whose ancestors had been priests 
to the Kos, whom the Edomeans had formerly esteemed as a god. But after Hyrcanus had made a change in their political government and made them receive the Jewish customs and law, Herod made Castiberos governor of Idumea and Gaza, gave him his sister Salome to wife. And this was upon the slaughter of his uncle Joseph, who had that government before, as we have related already. When Castabaros had gotten to be so highly advanced, it pleased him and was, and was more than he hoped for, and he was more and more puffed up by his good success. In a little while he exceeded all bounds and did not think it fit to obey what Herod, as the ruler, commanded, commanded him, or that the Idumeans should make use of the Jewish customs or be subject to them. He therefore sent to Cleopatra and informed her that the Idumeans had been always under his progenitors, and that for the same reason it was but just that she should desire that country for him of Antony, for that he was ready to transfer his friendship to her, and this he did, not because he was better pleased to be under Cleopatra's government, but because he thought that upon the diminution of Herod's power, it would not be difficult for him to obtain the entire government over the Idumeans, and somewhat more also, for he raised his hopes still higher, as having no small pretenses, both by his birth and by these riches which he had gotten by his constant attention to filthy lucre. And accordingly, it was not a small ma matter that he aimed at. So Cleopatra desired this country of Antony, but failed of her purpose. On account of this was, was brought to Herod, who was thereupon ready to kill Castabaros, yet upon the entreaties of his sister and mother, he forgave him, and vouchsafed to pardon him entirely, though he still had a suspicious of, suspicion of him afterward for this his attempt. Paragraph 10. But some time afterward, when Salome happened to quarrel with Castaberos, she sent him a bill of divorce and dissolved her marriage with him, though this was not according to the Jewish laws, for with us it is lawful for a husband to do so. But a wife, if she departs from her husband, cannot of herself be married to another, unless her former husband put her away. However, Salome chose to follow not the law of her, of her country, but the law of her authority, and so renounced her wedlock, and told her brother Herod that she left her husband out of her good will to him, because he perceived that he, with Antipater, and Lysimachus and Dositheus, were raising a sedition against him. As an evidence whereof, she alleged the case of the sons of Babas, that they had been by him preserved alive already for the interval of twelve years, which proved to be true. But when Herod thus unexpectedly heard of it, he was greatly surpri surprised at it, and was the more surprised because the, re the relation appeared incredible to him. As for the fact relating to these sons of Babas, Herod had formerly taken great pains to bring them to punishment, as being enemies to his government. But they were now forgotten by him on account of the length of time since he had ordered them to be slain. Now the cause of his ill will and hatred to them arose hence, that while Antigonus was king, Herod, with his army, besieged the city of Jerusalem, where the distress and miseries which the besieged endured were so pressing that the greater number of them invited Herod into the city and already placed their hopes on him. Now the sons of Babas were of great dignity and had power among the multitude and were faithful to Antigonus and were all, always raising calumnies against Herod, 
and encouraged the people to preserve the government to, the, to that royal family which held it by inheritance. So these men acted thus politically and, as they thought, for their own advantage. But when the city was taken and Herod had gotten the government into his hands and Castiberos was appointed to hinder, hinder men from passing out at the gates and to guard the city, that those citizens that were guilty and of the party opposite to the king might not get out of it, Castabaros, being sensible that the sons of Babos were, uh, were had in respect and honor by the whole multitude, and supposing that their preservation might be of great advantage to him in the changes of government afterward, he set them by themselves and concealed them in his own farms and when the thing was suspected, he assured Herod upon oath that he really knew nothing of that matter, and so overcame the suspicions that lay upon him. Nay, after that, when the king had publicly proposed a reward for the discovery, and had in practice all sorts of methods for serving out this matter, he would not confess it, but being persuaded that when he had at first denied it, if the men were found, he should not escape unpunished. He was, he was forced to keep them secret, not only out of his good will to them, but out of a necessary regard to his own preservation also. But when the king knew, nothing, um, knew the thing by his sister's information, he sent men to the places where he had the intimidation, uh, the, in, the intimation they were concealed and ordered both them, both them and those that were accused as guilty with them to be slain insomuch that there were now none at all left of the kindred of Hyrcanus and the kingdom was entirely in Herod's own power and there was nobody remaining of such dignity as could put a stop to what he did against the Jewish laws. So that concludes our reading of Josephus for tonight. Lord willing, we will do chapter 8 tomorrow. How oh, ten men of the citizens of Jerusalem made a conspiracy against Herod for the foreign practices he had introduced, which was a transgression of the laws of their country, concerning the building of Sebaste and Caesarea and other edifices of Herod. Okay. All right. So, let's see what we got here in the live chat. All right. JR says, Shalom, y'all. Shalom, JR. Welcome and blessings, blessings multiplied to you. A lot of modern women lack moderation, also, unfortunately, says JR. Sean says, Shalom, all. Shalom, John, or Sean, excuse me. Uh, welcome, blessings, blessings multiplied to you. Good to see you. All right, so we got, I got a couple comments that I promised to read and respond to. One is from Soldier of Yahweh. Uh, we see Soldier of Yahweh in the live chat there from earlier. Okay. Soldier of Yahweh. The Shalom Christopher. Shalom Soldier of Yahweh. So, by the way, those of you who don't know, uh, Torah is key to life. Uh, identified himself as Soldier of Yahweh yesterday. So it's the same person. Uh, it says, Shalom Christopher. So it was either last night's live stream or the night before. But you spoke about how original sin is a false doctrine. Yes, I do believe original sin is a false doctrine. In other words, well, I believe that the doctrine of original sin is, is not true at all. I think that it's against the scriptures. I think that it's against common sense. I think that it's against justice. I don't think that God operates by that doctrine at all. This person says, I do like to believe in original sin because the Bible points out that sin exists because of Adam and Eve. Okay, first, 
My first question, is, uh, Soldier of Yahweh, where does the Bible say that sin exists because of Adam and Eve? Where does it say that? Soldier of Yahweh, could you, could you quote me chapter, verse, or something to that effect? I'd like to know what, where it says that. I'll give you some time there, and then we'll... Uh, I'll move on here to, I see we have Quranic explanation. Quranic explanation has left a comment. Uh, this was, it says here 12 hours ago. So it would have been earlier this morning. This comment, the age of the law started with Ark Apostle of God, Noah, peace be unto him. I understand that uh, the reason I understand that a lot of people think that that uh, the, um, the the age of the law started with Noah, and I understand the reason being is because of Noah's uh, well, not only because of Noah's mode of worship and his doctrine, at least how he believed the commands that he had, but also because of tradition that we have in Judaism that there's what they call the Noahide laws. Noahide laws. I, I do not believe in dispensationalism. There is a doctrine in, within some Christian circles that they call dispensationalism. In other words, uh, there are different dispensations, meaning like there are different ages. Okay? Different ages. Um, I do not, I do not believe in the doctrine of dispensationalism that, okay, first we have the Adamic age, then we have like the age of the law, then we have like the age of grace, you know, and there's different variations of dispensationalism. S some add a few more ages in there, you know, then after the age of grace, there's the age, there's the millennial, you know, reign of Christ. There's, so you got these different ages that are added in there. I do believe that God has a time for everything. I do believe that there are seasons for certain things. But I believe that there are things that do not have seasons. Things that are firmly and permanently established on earth and in the heavens. Of those things, I do believe that the Torah or the law is one of them. I also believe that grace is another one. I believe that the Torah the law, if you will, or grace and grace, uh, both of them have existed since the beginning of time and perhaps even before the beginning of time. Ha do, both of them do exist now and both of them will exist forever. Why do I believe that? Why do I believe that? How can I say that? I understand that the creator of this universe is a creator of, of mercy and grace. Right? He has created everything for, by grace, by his mercy, for his purposes. I believe that everything is under the watchful eye of the creator. I believe that everything is done by his grace. In other words, by his mercy. We're not, uh, the fact that the earth exists, I believe, is because of grace. I think he created the earth, for, you know, because of his grace. He created the human race because of his grace. At the same time, I believe that the law is an eternally timeless I hate to say object, but rather it's a timeless expression of God. Because I believe that the law of God is actually an extension of Him, a reflection of Him. I do not believe that God could ever exist. I do not believe that the Creator could exist without a law. So the law, I don't believe in a, in a lawless Creator. 
I believe in a lawful creator. I believe that the, that the creator, the law, if you will, is an expression of the, it's, it's, a re, it's an expression of the creator. It's a reflection of the creator. In other words, like, do not bear false witness, for example. Well, that's because the creator doesn't bear false witness. You know, do not worship any other God. Well, that's just a reflection of his, his ways, his will, you know, him, basically. Now, if you were to take this concept, which I think it's, I think we can take the concept of law slash lawgiver, we can take it right across the board from the spiritual into the carnal, if you will, or into the earthly. Is there any country on earth today that exists and is governed that does not have a law? I'm not aware of any country that is actively governed in any time in history, let alone today, that does not have some kind of law system. We have the authorities, and then we have the law that comes from the authorities. So we have, uh, we have the law givers, and then we have the law. If the law is good, that probably is because the lawgivers are good. If we have evil lawgivers, we have an evil law. If we have holy and righteous lawgivers, we have a holy and righteous law. If we have no lawgivers, we don't have a law. I believe that God, the creator of all, always did exist. And just because he existed and he was always in authority, that in and of itself proves that the law always existed. I believe the law existed before, before the first second of time ever was ever recorded. I believe the law would, will, is now in effect and that all should obey the law and will always be in effect, the law of God. Now, there are different aspects to the law that are applicable to different people. Like, for example, we get the story of Adam and Eve. Now, they had a law, right? I mean, so the law did not begin with uh, Abel or with Job or with Abraham or with Noah or with Moses, the law began, began with God. The law is, you know, again, a reflection. The law is a representation of who God is and his ways. So Adam and Eve, we have in the story of the Holy Scriptures in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, they were given a law. Now, of course, they would not be given the like a, a law that would pertain to a nation as Moses did because they didn't have a nation to, they didn't have an, a whole uh, multitude of people to lead, you know, into the promised land or to, uh, you know, to, to rule. And so they didn't have those laws. Or I should say they did not, um, th those laws did not apply to them. I believe it's like, you know, you hear a lot today about the quote unquote, the cloud, meaning like uh, the internet, like reservoir of, uh, of information and services in, in, in the cloud, right? So you can download or upload things to and from the cloud. I believe that the law of God is the same way. I think that it always did exist. If you can just picture it like as if it's in the heavens, the Torah, the law is eternal. There's no beginning to it. There's no ending of it. There's never going to be a time when God exists where there is no law. God is not a, a lawless God. And God never exists. I don't think there ever was a time when God ever existed without law. Like, I don't think that he's like, well, God is there, you know, 400 
quadrillion years ago, God was there, but no law was there. It's a lawless. He, you know, he existed in, in lawlessness. No, 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 no. There was always law. Because the lawgiver was always there. It's, the question is, what law applied to Adam and Eve? I think we know, at least we have a, jet, a gist of what, what applied to them. What law applied to Abraham? We know that Abraham had the law, okay? And Abraham existed before Noah. Or, hold on a second. Abraham existed after Noah. That's true. But we know that Abel had a law. Abel, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, you know, their son, Abel, and Cain, we know that they had laws. So how do you know that how do you know that Cain and Abel had the Torah? Well, it talks about Cain's sin. And so how could it be possible for Cain to sin? How could Cain be charged with, with sin if there's no law? How is it possible that Abel would know how to serve God and worship God without the law. It's impossible. It's just impossible. The law teaches us, t- tells us, instructs, instructs us how to worship and serve God. Abel knew how to do that. He knew it right down to the detail because it says not only did he know about worshiping God and about serving God, it says that he knew about the sacrificial system as well, which was part of the law, of course. So he knew what, like, first of all, how would he know about sacrifice? How would he know about that without a law? Like, he can't just make it up. There's got to be a law there. How would he know what to sacrifice? He knew exactly what to sacrifice. The firstborn of the lambs. The best. He knew exactly what to sacrifice. How did he know not to sacrifice an ant? Or a stone? Or anything you can imagine. How did he know not to sacrifice a worm? I'm just saying. How did he know not? How did he know exactly What to sacrifice according to the law of Moses before the law of Moses was recorded? How did he know about that whole system? The whole system of sacrifice? What to sacrifice? Where to sacrifice it? How to sacrifice it in the proper way that pleased God? Now, Cain, he did not please God according to the Torah. Why did he not please God? Because he did not give God's He did not give God his best. Abel gave God his best according to the law. Amen? Abel gave God his best. He took of the best of his flock, the firstborn, and he gave it to God. According to the law. Perfectly according to the law. Cain did not. It doesn't say that Cain gave the first fruits of the crops, which he was supposed to, according to the law, it just says that he gave of the crops. So not the first fruits. So it's probable, if not most likely, that he gave the worst. He, because he saved the best for him, right? He didn't, gave, he didn't give the first fruits to God. So if he didn't give the first fruits, why would he give the Mediocre. Why would he? He would probably just say, I'm, I'm just going to bring any old sacrifice. The bottom of the barrel. That's why God was displeased with him and did not accept his sacrifice. Did not accept his offering. Because he did not do it according to the law. The law existed in the days of Adam and Eve and Abel and Cain. Job. This is like long before Moses. Noah, of course, yes. I don't think this is a this is a this is a point of contention at all. I think we all we all know that Noah had the law. He again, how do we know that Noah had the law? 
because it tells us he knew again about the sacrificial system. He knew what to sacrifice. He knew the difference between clean and unclean animals. He knew the differences, the difference between righteousness and sin. And by the way, Cain and Abel did as well. You cannot have a, you cannot know the difference between righteousness and sin without a law. It's impossible. Impossible. So I believe that God, there are, there are seasons, yes. There are times and ages, if you will, for certain things. Yes, absolutely. God did create it that way. However, I do believe that according to the evangelical dispensationalism, Christian doctrine, I don't believe that is accurate because I believe they take what is timeless and eternal and they make, it, make them into ages, like this is the age of the law, this is the age of grace. Come on. God created the entire universe out of, he created it out of his love, his mercy, his grace. He created the human race. He gave us so much. Amen? He gave us so much. And I believe that the giving of the law to Adam and Eve, to Cain and Abel, was, in fact, an act of grace. As any good father would give his children instruction so that it will go well with them, so the Creator gave his wonderful, wonderful people instructions to live by, how to worship him, how to serve him, how to live right. And that was there from the very beginning. Now, yeah, I will say this, the the law that Adam uh, knew and obeyed was different. I mean, there were different different concept or different precepts that you would say ordinances that would apply to Moses that didn't apply to Adam, applied to Abraham that didn't apply to Noah. Uh, okay, but the, the the idea is this, the best way to look at it is this. The law is like a cloud. It's like the cloud. Like the, it's like the, the cloud of the internet. Okay? It's figuratively speaking, it's like the cloud. And you download whatever applies to you. Adam and Eve, they were in a certain circumstance that a lot of laws did not apply to them. So they downloaded from the law, from the eternal law, that which applied to them. Same with Abel and Cain. They downloaded, if you will, uh, laws that apply to them, given the circumstances that they were in. Same with Enoch. Same with Seth. Same with Methuselah. Same with Noah. Same with Abraham. Same with Moses. Same with David. Today, we have, we're, we're, we're in a different circumstance than Adam was in, different circumstance that Abel was in, different circumstance that what Moses was in. So we download what applies to us, right? There are laws that apply to certain people that would not apply to everyone. So we go by the laws that apply to us because it's, eter it's an eternal law. Psalm 119 verse 89 your word O lord is forever settled in heaven see when david wrote that down what do you think he was thinking about your word is forever settled in heaven not oh well it's it's there temporarily but it was it's 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 like it's a permanent thing it's a perpetual thing forever there timeless what do you think David was thinking about when he penned those words in Psalm 119 verse 89 I don't think he was thinking about his own his own writings the Psalms I think he was thinking about the Torah because especially in those days the Torah especially the, the Torah that came through Moses if anything was considered to be the word of God that would have been the word of God keep in mind there were a lot of people 
back in those days that did not necessarily believe that the Nevi'im, the prophets, Nevi, uh, were quote unquote word of God. Okay, they looked at the the Nevi'im in the same way that the Protestants today look at the Apocrypha. Well, yeah, their writings, but well, we don't. That's not canonized. That or that's not, you know, that's not holy scripture. That's just you know writings from men. Yes, so thank you, Quranic Explanation, for your comment. Appreciate that. John says, do you think demons are responsible for things like sickness, mental illness, etc., or is there always a rational explanation for such things? I think this is, can be a false a dichotomy, John, because let me, I don't think there, it's like one way or another. The word demon, I, I need to define this, and I'm not sure what you, exactly what you mean, John, by the word demon, but I'll start by my definition. So, um, I remember years ago, I spoke to, there was this lady I spoke to about demons. Like, I'm, there was this lady I spoke to face-to-face in this, uh, about demons, and after speaking to her about demons for quite a while, I finally, it's like, Oh, you don't understand the word demons in the same way that I like. She, when I was talking to her about demons, she was just, she thought that I was just talking about personality traits. I'm like, no, I'm not talking about personality traits. I'm talking about literal uh, spiritual entities, entities that think for themselves, basically, or they can think. They have a, you know, they can move spirits. That's what I'm talking about. And when I said that to her, it's like, wow, oh, you're, is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. So. John, I, I think I need to define this to begin with. And this is why a lot of times, if, if you notice, a lot of times I use the phrase evil spirits instead of demons. That's why. Because I had, I, had a, I had an experience years ago with this lady. And I was talking about demons this, and, and, and I was talking about demons. And she was like, you know, listening to me and talking to me and asking me questions and all that kind of thing. And then afterward, I, I'm like, oh, wait a second. You don't, uh, okay, you think that I'm talking about just personality traits. No, 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 no. I'm talking about spirits, entities, spiritual entities, uh, you know. So, John, I think I need to clarify this right up front. In the context of my answer, what I'm talking about is spiritual entities. Spirits that... Or disembodied spirits, if you will, or spirits that would that that can move, see, think, feel, have emotions, yada yada yada. Okay, Sp- speak. They are literal entities, beings, if you will. That's what I mean. So, it, going by that definition of de- of demons, I would say. I would say that we have to be careful when it comes to this thing because you can get like overly obsessed with this kind of stuff. Don't get me wrong. I think that, I think that there is a spiritual world that has many kinds of spirits, both evil and good spirits. And I think that there are spiritual, there are spirits behind Basically everything that happens on earth. You know, I believe the Holy Spirit, God is behind a lot. And good spirits are behind. I believe that there are evil spirits as well. However, I do not believe in, in going around. Like I, I know of one guy, uh, he was like, he was like seeing demons, you know, everywhere. Like Maybe not literally, but he thought like it, like it's like a demon behind every bush and you know behind every tree and you know. Remember one time he was saying that he was driving along a road and he saw uh, a tumbleweed go across the road. He thought it was a demon that w- that was this tumbleweed. It's like you know, no, not everything. <laughs> I don't believe it's healthy to look at to always think about thing everything as a demon. I think we should keep our 
our minds and our spiritual eyes on God and understand that He is in control always. And if there are evil spirits, then he'll, He can deal with them. He, he, he can allow or disallow. He can protect. He can shield. He can do whatever He does, and He does. He can and He does. So we need, I believe that we need to have our eyes on God more than anything else and trust Him. Having said that, I do believe that there are, I think that there are many different graduations, if you will, of these, of evil spirits. I think there are many different, there, there, is, there are many different levels of hierarchy and power of different evil spirits. I think that some evil spirits are super hard to deal with. Other evil spirits are very easy and very weak, very, you know, they're, they don't have a lot of power at all. Some evil spirits, I think, has a fair amount of power, depending, again, depends on how much uh, a person would give evil spirits. And we, I do believe that, that people give evil, evil spirits place and power by their disobedience. I think that there are a lot of times sickness, mental illness that, that do have evil spirits behind them, but I'm not saying every everything. And I don't think it's healthy or accurate to look at it as, as, as if everything needs to be exercised, but rather things to be, need, need to be corrected spiritually. In other, wo in other words, I think that a lot of times we don't need to see like exorcisms happen, happen as much as we need to see people get on the right track with God and God will take care of everything. You know, like what happened with me in my life back in August of 1992. I, I talk about it quite often and what happened with me there. I felt, and it's almost like I saw, so this was back in, in 1992 in August, after I went through a series of repentance, um, if I have that book, on, usually I have this book in front of me here, yeah I do, right here, it was this book right here, Winning Spiritual Warfare, um, re after reading that book in 1992, August, uh, I do believe that I felt and saw something leave me. And then I felt the Spirit of God come into me. Now, did I need to be like, was there like an exorcism kind of thing? No, not like, not like how you would think of it. Not like how you would see in the movies, but rather just, it was just an experience. Me, me alone in my, in my room as, as a teenager. Now, I said earlier, John, that I think it's like a false dichotomy because I think that it all has a rational explanation anyway. I don't think that there's a, there's a choice. Like, it's either it's uh, demons or a rational explanation. No. Because God is on his throne and because everything is under his power anyway, every, he's still, he's rule. Like, he rules. God rules. He reigns. He's on his throne. He didn't fall off his throne. So whatever happens, be it with good spirits or angels or demons or whatever the case is, whatever happens, all of it has a rational explanation because God is a rational God. If, if someone has angels with them and protects them, I think this is God and there's a rational explanation for that. You can dig it up in the scriptures and talk about why God would do that. Likewise, if somebody is afflicted by demons or do, does have some kind of unfortunate circumstance because of an evil spirit, I think that that can also be definitely could be uh, explained rationally. Like, for example, just I'm just giving you an example. I think that a lot of people suffer spiritually 
you could say, from evil spirits to one degree or another because of the bitterness in their heart. Because they hold a grudge, hold a grudge against their father or against their mother or, or uh, their friend or their whoever. They hold a grudge and because of that, they're afflicted. You know, it's like it eats them up. And spiritually, because of that, they, they, they can. I'm not saying it all... <laughs> But they can be afflicted by evil spirits because holding on to a grudge is disobeying God's law. Right? Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, do not bear a grudge. Do not bear a grudge. So when people bear a grudge, they actually violate the law of God. And because of that, they give legal rights to evil spirits. Likewise, if you obey God, you invite the presence of God or the angels of God to assist you and to be there to protect you. And there's a rational explanation for it. Why? Because of your obedience. Because this is what it says in the scriptures. Because that's the way God operates. Because God is judge. He's still on the throne. He's, he's on the bench, so to speak. And he's always passing judgment. Every judgment has a rational explanation. Whether it's a, a judgment that an evil spirit from God will go and, and uh, afflict King Saul, like it says in the scriptures that it did, there's a rational explanation for that. Saul gave that spirit legal right to do that. So there's... there. Are, it's not one or the other. It's not like there are demons or rational explanations. No, no. There are demons or angels, and there are also rational explanations as to how all of this stuff works. I think the best way to do it is to ensure, do everything you possibly can to ensure you're on the right track with, with God. You're doing everything you can possibly do to obey Him. And he will look after everything. He'll look after the rest. You don't have to worry. As Yeshua said, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Seek the Lord says they used to hang dispensation charts in some churches. I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. Sean says no to dispensationalism. Amen to that, Christopher. Yes. John says, is the devil... Made me do it ever a good justification for a negative action against someone or yourself. Again, I, I, I believe that uh, at the end of the day, it's all God, okay? It's, it's between you and God. Like, if you choose to obey God, then you know, God's going to help you out with that. If you choose to disobey God, then, you know, you can say an evil spirit or, or there, the devil can have legal right within, you know, in your life. Here's the question. Did the devil ever make Yeshua do anything? Did the devil ever make Yeshua do anything? John, the devil doesn't have any power that God doesn't give him. Look at the story of Job. 
The devil couldn't do anything, no, nothing at all, if, if it didn't come from God first. God had to give the order. God had to give the judgment and, the, and set the boundaries for the devil. See, so what am I saying? So what's my point? My point is whatever power the devil may have over you, talk to God about it. That's my point. That's my point. You're right with God. You stay right with God. You do whatever you can to obey him. I think you're, 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 on the good, you're on the good side. You don't have to worry about anything. Thank you, John. Sean says law equals structure, justice, and boundaries. No law equals chaos and death. That's for sure. Amen to that, Sean. Thank you. Quranic explanation says, I do agree, the Torah, the, the gospel of Jesus, the literal words of God given to Jesus rather than the pseudo-gospels that were written by men hundreds of years after Jesus. However, the Torah, I believe, was specific to B'nai Israel. The Messiah, King, was promised for B'nai Israel, and, and it was Jesus. They rejected their Messiah and hence broke the covenant with God. You see, according to the Torah, uh, according to the Torah, it says there's like one law for all. It's one law for uh, the native-born Israelites, and there's one law for the Goy as well. I mean, it's, I mean, there's it's one law for all of it. One law applies to all people. I don't think that there is a law that doesn't apply to anybody. I don't think that say God doesn't. God, God doesn't have a law that applies to, you know, somebody who is not born of a certain ethnicity, for example. I think that God, God's law, again, is forever settled in heaven, that never changes, never would change, never has changed, because God doesn't need an update, he doesn't need to upgrade, and so therefore, the question should be for everybody in, in, in any part of the world, the question should be, what law applies to you? Are you a man? Well, the laws for men apply to you. Are you a woman? The laws for women apply, apply to you. It does speak about one law for, for all. I, I will say this as well. I, I believe that every law that the Creator uses to create His 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 um, universe is God's law. I know that's like I know that sounds overly simplistic, but I but hear me out. I do believe that the Creator has laws that are not necessarily written in any quote unquote religious book. How can I say that? What do I mean? How Christopher? What do you mean? No, look. Okay. For example, we have the laws of nature. The Creator created those laws. Those laws are God's laws, as much as any other law is. The laws of physics is another thing. The laws of mathematics. These are laws that were put in place. The, the Creator made sure that these laws were evident in creation. So I think that all of this stuff applies right across the board. So what am I saying? What's my point here? My point is, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, where you live on the earth, what family you're from, God's laws still apply to you. Whether you're an atheist or a, a, a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, God's, God's laws still apply to you no matter what. Whether you believe it, whether you don't believe it, it just doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter who you are. God's laws are solid and unchangeable. You know? The laws of physics apply to everybody, whether they believe it or not. You know, I know there's a lot, there are some people, not, not a lot, but there are some people in the world today that don't very much believe in the laws of physics. Uh, however, 
hey, the laws of phys physics apply no matter what. It's just it's it's a concrete thing that's that you can't change and it doesn't change. That's what physics is is all about. Same with um, you know the laws of nature and such. So at the end of the day, God's law is God's law. It doesn't change. It's for everyone to whom it applies. So we know that the laws of God the Torah, okay, even if you say that the Torah started with Noah, which I think, it, I think this, the Torah started with God, but even if you say the Torah started with Noah, then that goes against the idea that the Torah is only for B'nai Israel, because Noah is not the son of Israel. Noah is not the son of Israel, but yet the Torah applied to him. Rightfully so. Same with Adam and Eve. Same with Cain and Abel. And everyone that ever existed. And that does exist and ever will exist. Thank you. Appreciate that. Randy says, I believe in the legends of the Jews. The Creator consulted with the Torah to go forward with the creation. Yeah, the legends of the Jews are just, it's really an interesting, interesting account of, of, the, of these things. And we did read quite a bit of this. This was a couple years ago now. We did read a fair amount of the legends of the Jews right on the live stream here. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I think that everybody should have that in their library, so to speak. Kash, Kashush. Kashushna, Kashnashu, Kabash, Kabushashnu says, sorry if I just mutilated your username there. It says, are you AI? Uh, no, there's no artificial intelligence here. It's all real intelligence, okay? Thank you for your question. Quranic explanation with regards to Abel. He was the son of a a Adam, whom, who, do, who God taught directly. He didn't have a set law. However, God chose Adam as a prophet, so he revealed upon him what he wanted from them. So I think, uh, I suppose at the end of the day, it depends on what scripture you want to go by, but according to, the, according to Genesis, and it depends what you mean by set law too. So do I believe that a, a law was in writing in the days of Cain and Abel? No, I'm not saying that. I think that law can exist without it being in writing. I think there could be, like, again, uh, we have the laws of nature, the laws of physics that, that existed for how many years so far before anybody ever wrote about it or studied it. So we don't know. It doesn't tell us exactly how Abel knew the Torah or that law. It doesn't tell us exactly. We can only speculate. And if we, if, we're, if we want to be honest, we can only say, well, this is what I think could have happened. But it doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us that God taught. Well, it, it, told us, it tells us that God gave Adam that command, which was one command. However, you could argue, and uh, I'll give... In a, Anybody, this is you could argue that in that one command is the is the entire Torah. I mean, you can unpack it to be the entire Torah. So you could say yes in that way. You could say that God taught Adam, but it doesn't explicitly tell you that. So it doesn't tell us exactly how Adam knew that. Did God teach him face to face? Did he t teach him in dreams? Did he drop a book out of heaven? It doesn't tell us what happened. It really doesn't. All it says is that God gave Adam. A command it doesn't tell us exactly how Abel received the, the, uh, that law either. So again, we can just talk about it. We can say, well, this is what I think probably happened, or this is what I speculate to have happened. Maybe you know, Adam told him as Adam was a prophet. Okay, that's fine. 
uh, or you can say that Abel had a personal revelation from God himself. Well, whatever. Like to me, it's like it doesn't tell us. So, I mean, we don't really have much to go on. But I do believe it was the the everlasting law of God that never changes, that n- doesn't have a beginning, and that doesn't have an end. If it if it's a law that's just kind of temporary, in and out kind of thing, then that's that's a very unstable God to give someone an unstable law. It's the same law, as far as we can see, that that Moses received, especially in regards to the worship and sacrifice. It's the same law. So it, it, it certainly was something that stayed in place for a long time, and I think it still is in place. I'll just, I'll just call you Kabush. Kabush says, yeah, I agree with you. Soldier of Yahweh says, I, uh, I have to rewind. I've been busy. I wish to, ha- wish to have stayed to reply to you sooner. Okay. Uh, Soldier of Yahweh says, there isn't a verse in my claim. What I'm saying is the way the Bible speaks about the event of Adam and Eve that they are the reasons we sin. Okay, so what way are you talking about? Here's the question. Again, it comes back to the same question. How do you get that? Where do you get that from? What passage? What verse? What do you mean by the way the Bible speaks about it? Can you, can you give me a passage that would, that would support this claim? Could you give me a passage that supports your claim? And we can unpack it and we'll go right into it as, as much as possible. Soldier of Yahweh says, And when, when Adam and Eve are of the fruit of the tree, and Adam and Eve are of the fruit of the tree, people started committing sin, as I said in my comment. Pain killing is it. Okay, but that doesn't prove that... Th- okay. Doesn't so the claim was, as you said here, that sin exists because of Adam and Eve. That okay, so there's a story that says that Adam and Eve sinned, and then later on Cain sinned, doesn't mean that sin exists because of Adam and Eve. It doesn't even mean that Adam Adam and Eve. It doesn't even say explicitly that Adam and Eve were the first ones that sinned. This is why we talk about critical thinking a lot here. Like, what does the passage say? What does it not say? Because what it doesn't say can be as loud or even louder than what it actually does say. For some reason, um, I have been receiving a lot of comments recently in the past few days about Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, the creation story. I've, I've been receiving a lot of comments and a lot of people that have been dropping a lot of different claims and questions about Genesis 1 and 2. Maybe sometime we should do a series on that as well, even if it's just two or three live streams. We have already, I have already did... Um, Several live streams, just only on Genesis chapter 1, done several. There are probably, I'm just guessing, close to 10 hours of content on my YouTube channel right now in regards to just Genesis chapter 1. Soldier of Yahweh says, and I believe it's very straightforward that we sin starting from Adam and Eve. Why do you believe that? Why do you believe? Just because, it's, just because it mentions a couple that sinned thousands of years ago doesn't mean that sin exists because of them. And it doesn't mean that we started, we sin starting from Adam and Eve. It doesn't mean that. See, this is the 
I encourage y'all to take off the filters, right? To take off the glasses, because I know we've all been taught about this. We've been taught about the doctrine of original sin. We've been taught about, you know, like Sunday school stories about the, the, the creation story and all this kind of stuff. Let's just take off the filters for a moment and look at it. Look at the raw data that we got in front of us. Look at the raw data. Quranic explanation. Again, we got claims here that has no support. You say, if you're not familiar with the language of God, which God spoke in, uh, translations with pre pre-assumed agendas in mind corrupt the true message of God. Okay, let's not idolize a language. It's idolatry. Doesn't matter what language it is. And I know there are religions in the world today that do idolize languages. I believe very strongly that God has spoken to me very strongly. There is this time in my life, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details, a very, very crucial time in my life. And God spoke to me so clearly. I... He spoke to me so clearly that something was going to happen. It was so clear, you could, figuratively speaking, you could, you, figuratively speaking, you can cut it with a knife. I argued with God. I argued with God. No, no. I, I argued with God. Did he speak in English? No. Did he speak in Hebrew? No. Did he speak in Greek? No. Did he speak in Arabic? No. It's the language of the Spirit, because God is a Spirit. So in order for me to relay to you what God said, I have to take the Word of God, the, the spiritual, and filter it through man's language, earthly language, be it any of those languages or any other language. It has to be stripped of its whole spiritual power, and it has to be translated into something you can actually write on a piece of paper using corruptible writing mediums with corruptible ink or toner on a corruptible piece of paper or parchment or anything else. So, I know that there's a lot of people that have strong opinions as to what the language of God is. I believe that the language of God is a language of the Spirit. It's not, it's not something that is that you can contain within letters on a piece of paper. It's not that frivolous. It's not that shallow. It's not that weak. The, the language of God is not something that you could adequately Relay with a corruptible tongue and lips. Much more powerful than that. You have to filter it down and, and, and you have to... Any prophet in history, if, if, if any, whoever, you, whoever would be, whoever you want to think of as a prophet, if they really heard from God, they have to take that spiritual, powerful voice, the same voice that it says in the scriptures, they breaks the cedars. Breaks the cedars. The same voice that created the world, the universe. You have to take that voice and somehow reduce it into man's language that you can speak with earthly men, lips of human beings, of mortals. You hear what I'm saying?
So any language that a man speaks is, is a translation of the original language of God. You name it. Any language on earth today is a... Tr if you were to take the a real word of God in the spiritual realm, you have to translate it down to any of these other languages that can, that can in turn be written on paper or parchment, animal skin, or stone, whatever. Whatever. The real voice of God is far, far more powerful than anything that, that a piece of paper can hold. The real voice of God is far, far more powerful than any book can relay to you. This is why it's so, so vitally important for people to have a personal relationship with Him. And, and so that His Spirit you know him by his spirit. It's not just all data in your head. It's not just some kind of information you got stored up in your brain, but rather it is a powerful, real, spiritual existence and being in and through you. And by the way, those, that time that I was referring to earlier, when I believe that God spoke to me, it was something that shook my being. I, I argued. I argued. It was something that shook me so much. A lot more than just words on a piece of paper could ever shake me. Something that shook me so much. God told me that something was going to happen. And it did happen. And it was something that was a very, very serious turn of events in my life. Soldier of Yahweh, what is dispensationalism? So there are different forms of dispensationalism. Some, some are like... So what they do is this. It's a very... Uh, it, it's, it's from... Uh, it's not that old of a doctrine. It's like maybe... Uh, I think it's less than 300 years old. It's a, very, it's a relatively new doctrine. And by the way, if it's new, it's probably not true. So it's a relatively new doctrine, and what they did, it's a, I, I don't know how to say it other than being very brutally honest here. It's a very stupid, very, very stupid way of, of interpreting the scripture. So what they did, so the, it all started back, as far as I as far as I see it, it started back with King Jimmy. Good old King Jimmy comes out with his translators and they translate the scriptures. Now back in those days, in you know the 1600s, the, they used words that maybe it was a lot better for them to understand, like and interpret that. But what happened was after a while, these words changed their meaning. You know, just like how today in English we have a lot of words that change changes its meaning. We spoke about this before. Very good. In, uh, a, a couple good. I'll give you a couple good examples. The word bully. Bully. Today, you know, bully. Everybody knows what a bully is today. But not too, not, not too long ago, 
relatively speaking, you know, a few hundred years ago or so, the word bully meant lover. Lover. Yes, lover. He's my bully. Or it can also mean brother. Hey, man, you're my, bro you're my bully, man. You're my bully. So, it, I mean, see how much it changed in a, very, in a relatively short period of time. Same with the word nice. The word nice in its original form means stupid, foolish, ignorant. I'll show, you guys might say, oh, Christopher, you're just making, what do you, where, where do you get this stuff from? Here, I'll show you. If you go to, there's a website called Etim Online. Etim Online. E T Y M. O N L I N E dot com. And you put in and you search for something like nice. Nice? It'll tell you what the history of this word means. It's from the late 13th century, meaning foolish, ignorant, frivolous, senseless. In the 12th century, Care, uh, careless, clumsy, weak, poor, needy, simple, stupid, silly, foolish. You don't want to be a nice guy, right? But you see how far, how it's changed. You know, it didn't, you look at other words that have changed, even, the, even, even in the past, say, 60, 70 years. You guys could probably think of a few other words that have changed their meaning so much. So in King James, you got this word called dispensation. Dispensation. It may, it may have been, it may have been an okay translation back in the day, but today it, it means something. The word dispensation means something completely different than, than what you, than what it used to mean. So if you look up uh, dispensation in the King James, for example, and it started, or at least popularized here in the King James, you got, uh, it only, it, it, it's only found four times in the Christian Protestant Bible. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians 9.17, Ephesians 1.10, Ephesians 3.2, Colossians 1.25. And you notice, I put the Strong's Greek numbers up here for you guys to see for yourself it's every one of these times that dispensation is used it's the same word in the greek 36 22 36 22 36 22 36 22 if you go over to 36 22 and you look up the real meaning of it it means the management of a household or house household affairs oversight administration overseer stewardship it doesn't mean a dispensation of time meaning like an age so this is what dispensationalism teaches dispensationalism teaches that there are different quote unquote dispensations and these dispensations are different ages different time frames when god does different things like first of all you got the adamic dispensation which it was the the rule of god through you know how he did through adam from adam until let's say noah for example and then there's the no noah noahide dispensation for example from noah again there are different there are different doctrines of dispensationalism like some some of it puts it all as either the uh, dispensation of the age of the law versus the age of grace and then there's the millennial age all this kind of nonsense. It's like they take an old word that mean that meant something different than what it means today, and they take the the modern meaning of that word and apply it to that to that old usage of that word. It's like why? Like this is why I say I I can't I don't know of any other word to use to explain this other than it's a stupid, very stupid interpretation the word dispensation should be translated as management administration you know instead of 
translating it as dispensation, which makes it sound like today, it sounds like a, uh, like a chronological chunk of time. So this is dispensationalism. It is saying, well, you know, there's the dispensation of law or the, the age of the law. And this, this is when God operated and people were saved by the law. And then after that, Jesus came and died for us and so, yada, yada, yada. And then the, the dispensation of grace happened. So this is the age of grace where people are saved by grace now. And then later on, when Jesus comes back, he will, it, there will be the thousand year reign. And that will be the dispensation of the millennium. This is, you know, so it, it, it makes it, again, there's a false dichotomy. It makes it sound like that the law and grace are opposed to each other. Like it's either you go by grace or you go by the law. And again, this is something that's purported by the Gospel of John, unfortunately. The Gospel of John is, is where this dichotomy comes from, this false dichotomy. Because the Gospel of John, as we, talk, we spoke about this before, there are so many different contradictions in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is full of contradictions. I mean, generally speaking. It's got, there's a lot of contradictions in the Gospel of John. Contradicting with the Synoptic Gospels or contradicting with the, with the rest of the Law and the Prophets. One such thing is this. It's like, it's like well, um, I'm, I'm just going by memory now. In, in John where it says, the law came by Moses and grace and but but grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. So it makes it sound like there's a false di- like there's a there's a dichotomy going on. Like it's either you go with law or you go with grace. You go by the law, like Moses style, or you go by grace, Jesus style. So it it sets it up in a way that it's like there's a dichotomy there. And I believe it's a false dichotomy. I don't believe we should I don't, I don't believe that we should divide the law from grace because I do believe that the law is an act of grace, that God gave the law or revealed the law, I should say, because again, we were talking about this before. I believe the law is an eternal thing that existed as long as, as, long as God existed. It's just that people had, have had the, the, the fortune, the great fortune. Uh, they were fortunate enough to to see, uh, to hear, or to, to have that law revealed to them. And this is all by grace. The law, the law was given by grace, or revealed, I should say, by grace. The law, was, uh, it, it, the law is um, obeyed by grace. It's God's grace. It's, it's, I look at God as if he's like, just like any father on earth. Uh, any good, loving father would give his children rules or you know instructions to go by so that it will be well with them and in the same way we got god the father giving rules instructions for us to go by so that it will be well with us so why would he do that because of his grace right from the very beginning so dispensationalism is it's just a bad doctrine very bad Soldier of Yahweh says, and God has told Eve, in a sense, I think that B, I think that B shouldn't be there. Eve, in a sense, that her descendants will suffer. Uh, again, I think this is you're reading into it what it doesn't actually say, and I, and I think it comes from the bruise your head, and bruise your heel statement. Yeah, so. Um, so you vaguely alluded to a passage that you think is talking about original sin. You vaguely alluded to this passage. Let's quickly go over here. Um,
So Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, Genesis three sixteen. the woman said to the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Now, again, to who is he speaking? He's only speaking to one woman here. It doesn't say to all of the descendants. It doesn't say that. Okay, so again, let's, let's, let's use some good critical thinking skills here. What does it say? What does it not say? It doesn't say to all of your descendants. It says to the woman, to her. I will make your pains in childbearing very, very, very severe. Now that, again, what does that mean? What does that say? What does it not say? It doesn't say I will introduce pains. It doesn't say that. It just says I will make, it, I will make them very severe. Like they were severe before, but now they will be very severe. Again, I know it's hard to take off the, the filters and the glasses that we've all been looking, th you know, looking through because we read things into it that it doesn't say because we've heard things and we believe it and we say, yeah, that sounds good. Oh yeah. And then, so when we come to the text, we see things that's not even there. This is the bias, this cognitive bias when it comes to critical thinking, cognitive biases. Uh, tell me if I'm not, it, did I say anything that's not true? It just says, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Somebody might say, well, Oh, well, go and check other Bible translations. Okay, let's do it. Check other Bible translations. So good old King Jimmy comes along again and says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow. Okay, so that does not say I will introduce sorrow, but it's like you already had sorrow and I will multiply your sorrow. That's the way it sounds, right? In the New King James, the same thing. I will greatly multiply your sorrow. NLT, as much as NLT is not necessarily all that accurate. However, it says, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. Again, this doesn't mean I will introduce it. NIV, we, uh, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Okay. Uh, ESV, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. Yeah. So I think we all get the point here. A CSB, it says, I will intensify your labor pain. So it's not like, it's not like there, were, there were no pains before. Not what it says. It just says that it will be multiplied. It will be intensified. So, so far, it does not say anything about the descendants so far. Genesis 3, 16, uh, with painful labor, you will give birth to children. Okay, again, this is talking to one person. Your desire will, will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So basically God is putting her back in her place, so to speak, in, in, the, in, the, way, in the way that it speaks of in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Okay, um, God's order for Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.17, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit. Okay, so this is to Adam now. Okay, so... Um, So when, about the whole thing about crushing, he will crush your head and you will crush his heel. So this is, oops, sorry. This is, this is what God spoke to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Now, again, this could be interpreted as a one man, such as Jesus, as a lot of Christians, most, I'm, I'm sure all Christians would say this is talking about Jesus. This is, this is the first prophecy of the Messiah. This is not talking about all of everybody from, eh, it's talking about Jesus, right? And he will crush your head. Because if, if this is talking about all of the descendants, you can't, I don't think anybody in their right mind would tell me that Every descendant of Adam and Eve crushed the head of the serpent. So again, let's not read into it what it doesn't say.
Quranic explanation in the Quran, it says the way of God doesn't change and that the messenger Muhammad isn't new in, in that way of God, sending messengers warning and sending glad tidings. Those who rejects always gets destroyed. Yeah, is you know any this 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 could apply. Yeah, definitely. Any any anybody that would have the the word of God, especially the message of repentance and obedience, and I think every it it's definitely the message of God to obey. And if people don't obey, then they're not going to be in a good place. That's for sure. Thank you, Quranic explanation. Ali says, "Salam all, salam." Ali, see you. Peace. Quranic explanation says, now you make a great point. The, the main principles, laws of God don't change, but it's clear that Bani, Bani Israel uh, were disobedient to God's commands and they kept they kept for irrelevant details so God gave them it definitely is clear that they disobeyed that's for sure Quranic bless, um, Quranic explanation thank you Ali says, when Adam and Eve, quote-unquote, ate from the tree, they chose, to, they chose to do so, as in free will. They had the will to eat or not to eat. Yes. Quranic explanation, but translations are interpretations of men. The language in which God revealed, however, is the literal word of God. Yeah. Yes, that's true. I, I, I want to make sure it's clear that anything that you can write on paper, anything that, um, that mortal lips can actually phonetically uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Any word that mortal lips can been phonetically pronounced is is a translation because like the, the real language of God since God is a spirit is is far beyond anything is far more powerful than anything on earth anything that you could actually record on you know in with corruptible medium definitely thank you Quran ex, Quranic explanation Lowe says, yes, maybe we should do a few live streams con concentrating on Genesis 1, and that would be very interesting and helpful for some. Yeah, thank you, Lo. Lord willing, we'll do that. Quranic explanation says, of course, God doesn't have language, but well, not earthly language, yes, that's what of course, if there was no language at all, God can, couldn't communicate at all. But the, but the scripture is revealed in a particular language that we can understand. Yes, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. This is the idea is that people would be able to understand it. And, and it's like you take this, this concept or this idea and it has to be filtered down into a language that's communicated and then the person who receives that communication um, hopefully uh, ideally is someone who can take that and unpack it back to its original Bo says, I agree, Christopher. If it's new, it's probably not true. I pray all return to the ancient paths. Yes. Ancient words ever true. I think y'all know the song, right? Changing me, changing you.
Seek the Lord. Ask the question. This is going to be something, you know, I'm going to be talking about this, Lord willing, next week. But I'll touch on it tonight, since you asked. Is this, this goes into the whole idea of the Holy Spirit and the movement of the Holy Spirit and all this kind of thing. Like, what is it and what is what it is, what, who is the Holy Spirit uh, and who he's not and how that, how, how that looks. So the question is, what do you think of the Pentecostal movement and the quote-unquote Azusa Street Revival, as it is called? I think it's very much like any other revival. And I use that word kind of reluctantly because there are so many different events that are called revival, and I don't think it really is a revival. When I, when I say revival, I'm talking about a movement that impacts people's lives to the point of changing their lives completely for the better. I will, I'll show you a quote, Seek the Lord, that um, the leader of that revival uh, wrote. I think it's an awesome quote. This is a quote here from William Seymour. William Seymour is the leader, or was the leader of the quote unquote Azusa Street Revival back in the early 1900s. For those of you who are not familiar with this revival that Seek the Lord is, is asking about, this, is, this revival, this movement w was. Uh, the Pentecostal Church, Assembly of God Church, a lot of uh, the Charismatic Church can all, all the Charismatic Churches can trace their roots back to this movement, at least to some degree being influenced by this movement. It was this little um, place in Los Angeles on Azusa Street that um, this particular minister, William Seymour, was leading the services there. And the whole idea, you know, the Pentecostal thing where it's like you know, speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff, the whole tongue-talking tongue, tongue talking movement uh, is basically, it, it's sprung out of this, this, this movement. Um, this Azusa Street revival is basically the roots of the Pentecostal tongue-talking movement. And I have, I am familiar uh, with churches that are very heavily, heavily pr pr uh, promote and push the, you know, talking in tongues. If you don't talk in tongues, you don't have it, you're not there, you're not spiritually advanced. You need to, you know, you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. All this kind of stuff that they teach, basically. Well, it's like, it's like to them, it's like a two-step salvation. It's like, well, the first step is accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're saved, but you're not. You're just barely in the door. You need the, you need the, uh, you need the gusto. You need, you know, you need the, 
the gift of the spirit, which would to them is, is the, the speaking in tongues, the gift of speaking in tongues. And so I've seen a lot of people that put great emphasis on this, but a lot of their lives do not reflect a holy God. The way they live, the way they talk, what they do. Um, the movies they watch. You know, all that kind of stuff does not reflect a holy God. Now, the leader, the father, if you will, of the tongue-talking movement, of the Pentecostal movement, said this. He actually wrote it. He said, if you get angry or speak evil or backbite, I care not how many tongues you have. You do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Is that a rebuke or is that a rebuke? Like, that is pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. If you get angry, speak evil, or backbite, I don't care how many tongues you may have, you have not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what the leader of that movement said. What do I think of the Pentecostal movement and the Azusa Street Revival, as it is called? Um, I, I think the same of the Azusa Street Revival as, much, as, as any other revival that's similar to this. Like we got Jonathan Edwards, we have the William Seymour, you know, we have like John Wesley, we have Evan Roberts, We have some of the more modern ones, like we got John G. Lake would be one in the last in the last um well John G. Lake was actually from from William Seymour's time frame. Uh more more recently, uh especially like for example, what uh, the revival that has happened um, let's say, for example, in Pensacola, Florida, with uh, John Kilpatrick. And there are uh, several others as well that have happened in the past hundred years. Uh, what do I think about them? Uh, I think that... I think that... It's, they're not perfect, but I think that God did a mighty thing. I think that God, in spite of the imperfections of William Seymour and any of these other revival, revivalists, leaders of these movements, in spite of what they may, they may not even teach everything perfectly. They may have doctrines that are not perfect they may say some things that are not true but god that doesn't stop god i don't think god says oh yeah you said something wrong that's it i'm out of here no but rather that in spite of all that god because of his grace does use these people did use these people and i'm not saying and i want to i know i I'll say it in a different way because I want to make sure I'm very clear here. I'm not saying that everything that William Seymour taught was, was 100%, neither any of the other ones. And there, I know that there, I, I don't want to mention any names because I'm, I don't like to, you know, give anybody a bad rap, but I'm not here to diss anybody. But there are people in history that I do believe God used very powerfully. But they were not in the right place themselves. Now, I'm going to take it all the way down to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. And 
I'm not saying that William Seymour is in that category. I don't, I have no, I have no reason to believe he is or he was. And I'm not saying that anybody else is in this category that I'm going to just bring up, but I'm going to bring it up because I do believe it is powerful. And I think it's true in Matthew seven verses 21 to 23. Jesus made it clear there were many will come to him on that day. What day? Well, the day of judgment. Many people will come to him, so they will come to him, professing, professing him to be Lord, but he will reject them. And they will say, well, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done many mighty miracles in your name? And in spite of all that, Jesus said that he will reject them because of their iniquity, because they were not following Torah. Anomian, literally in the Greek, negative to Torah, negative to the law. So these people, it sounds like these people were like, these people were like vessels of revival. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that all the men or women that that led revivals in history fit into that category no i'm not saying that at all and i hope they don't i hope they don't fit into that category or they didn't fit into that category all i'm saying is this it's possible to be a leader of a revival you can prophet like literally legit prophesy over people god speaking through you and yet you yourself can be rejected God using you to cast out evil spirits and yet you yourself be rejected. So we have these kind of revivals that, that, that have happened where you got some of these kind of things that, that, that go on, right? You got the exorcisms or you got these miracles that happen, prophecies, and this, all this stuff is wonderful. I think it needs to happen in every quote-unquote church, everywhere. I think it needs to happen everywhere. I think what happened in Azusa Street, at least that part of it, the the moving of the spirit and the giving of the spiritual gifts, it especially and especially leading people to repentance, because that's where it's that's what it's all that's where it's all at, right? That's what it's all about. If you don't have people, you know, if you don't have people repenting, or if there isn't a message somewhere somehow about repentance and obeying him getting on the right track with god i think that's why a lot of these revivals just kind of peter out or at least that could be one of the reasons and i'm not going to limit it to that i mean god is not very is it can get very complicated it could be because it's just you know there's nobody else that um Maybe it touched everybody that it, that it was there for to touch. So I do believe that the spiritual gifts do, they are real. I think that they, uh, they do operate today. But certainly not as popular as, as a lot of people would like to believe. A lot of churches... I think there's a lot of fake in it going on. I think there's a lot of people faking it. But that doesn't mean that the real deal isn't there too. So, make a long story short, like, I mean, just don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There might be some bathwater in any of these given revivals and it might not be pretty. It might not be clean in a way. Uh, certainly not something you want to drink, okay? But... But don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think that there is, uh, in, in many of these revivals, I think that there's a lot of stuff to learn. I think there's a lot of, I think that God used uh, people um, for these purposes. As long as we understand that they're not, not, they're not perfect. Like, who's perfect? I think really seek the Lord. I think if there wasn't, if, if there wasn't, if it wasn't for the Azusa street revival, where would, where would the world be really? 
I mean, it was through the Azusa Street Revival that we got a lot of the... I know there's been a lot of fakery going on as well. A lot of stuff and a lot of... Again, there, 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 is, there is the bathwater, but there is, there's the baby there as well. Yeah, those are my thoughts. Seek the Lord. Lord willing, next week we'll talk a lot more about this, about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit moves. Uh, what are the signs of the Holy Spirit? Uh, how to receive the Holy Spirit? How to identify faking it? You know, all this kind of stuff. Those are my thoughts. Seek the Lord. You know, it's just like with anything else. In the midst of a good fellowship, you can have some you can have some people that spoil it. So I wouldn't I wouldn't judge a whole movement unless you know that you know it's it's primarily just uh, something that's more uh, that the fruit is not all that great. Put it that way, or there's no fruit at all. I think that we should be very, very careful when it comes to any of these movements. I think we should be very, very careful uh, because let's just assume that we, let's just say we don't know whether it's the Holy Spirit or not. Let's just say we don't know it's the Holy Spirit or not. I think that we need to be very, very careful in speaking against the, the spirit behind these kind of movements in case it is the Holy Spirit. You don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You don't want to do that. So I think that people need to be very... I, I know a lot of people when it comes to all these different movements that have happened in the past, you know, even 100 years. I think that a lot of people have been so quick to judge and so quick to label. You know, I, I'm not a fan of someone coming around and saying, oh, this, you know, judging an entire movement based upon some bad fruit or something to that to that effect or some if you don't see the whole picture you know so a lot of people people a lot of times people pick out the worst and they judge the whole thing from the worst instead of looking at okay yeah we hear some negative stuff but what is there any positive at all is there anything positive are there people repenting are there um you know, people deciding to walk a, a, a life of righteousness. Yeah, that's it. Um, seek the Lord. And Lord willing, we'll talk a lot more about it next week. Appreciate the question. JR says, I'm totally open to jettisoning, jettisoning the doctrine of original sin. I just need some help seeing why it's unbiblical and what would replace it and why the replacement is better or, or more scriptural. Quranic explanation, what's your understanding of salvation? In my understanding, it's anyone who believes in God in the last day, he serves him alone and does righteous works. You know, I would say more or less, yeah, it, 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 it's what, like salvation, if you're talking about spiritual salvation, you, being right with God, I think that the answer would be, I would answer the same way that Jesus answered in the Synoptic Gospels. And that is, you know, how do you receive eternal life? How do you get saved? How do you have you know, salvation? Obey the commandments. That's what Jesus said, obey the commandments. And a lot, I know Christians say, well, you got to believe in Jesus. But what does believe in Jesus mean? If you say you believe in Jesus, how do you not go by what he says? If you say you believe in Je Jesus said, you must obey, you know, it's the commandments. He pointed to the commandments when it came to eternal salvation. Now, how can you say you believe in that man, but you don't believe in what he teaches? That, that's my question for a lot of Christians. And I know they bring up Paul and they always quote Paul. But I always say, you know, let's, let's be like the Bereans and say, 
okay, so what you understand what about Paul, how you interpret Paul, is this consistent with the law of God? Is this consistent with, with the prophets? If it is, okay, fine. If not, well, you need to make a choice. Either throw the prophets out or throw Paul out. So if, if Paul is contrary to the prophets, I recommend throwing Paul out. And what I mean is, again, I'm not saying just completely get rid of him and not, you know, I think we can learn a lot of things through Paul. What, I'm, what I mean is just throw that concept out instead of being overly, you know, simplistic about it. Thank you, Quranic Explanation. Yeah, JR, to, to answer, um, you said you need some help in seeing why it's unbiblical or what would replace it. So, I'm not going to get into a, a, an entire, we've already done whole videos on this topic, JR. If you want, search the, um, search the, uh, the channel for this original sin. We've done, we've done videos, a whole videos on this stuff. But I'll give you like a little appetizer, you know. Or a little sample, you know, a little sample at the, at the, at the, at the market, you know. I'll give you a little sample of why I think it's not correct. At least two, at least two reasons. But number one, the, the scriptures teach very clearly. It's the soul that sins shall, that shall die. The soul who sins shall die. Not the soul of the father or not the soul of the son of the father who sinned shall die. No, no, no. It's very clear. Deuteronomy 24, Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 33, to name a few. Very, very clear. You don't die because your father sinned. That's clear. Number two is, I, I think it's pretty... Um, I don't think it's it's anywhere as close to uh, to just to punish somebody for what their great 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 grandpa did. Okay, can you imagine somebody in prison, a six year old? Can you imagine a six year old in max maximum security prison? Oh. Hey, why are you in prison? Well, my great, 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 great grandfather did a horrible crime. That's why I'm in prison. Give me a break. You think that's you think that's just? Of course not. Of course not. It's totally unjust. That's not how God works. That's against what the scriptures teach. It's against it completely. The whole doctrine of original sin, as much as I understand it, is a doctrine that was fabricated to be a selling point for Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can, only Jesus, only Jesus can obey the law. We know we're all born in sin, but Jesus wasn't. It's 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 too it's a fabrication. Somebody made it up. It's a lie to sell Jesus. Now I, I have no trouble selling. Je I don't have no problem with anybody selling Jesus as long as you tell the truth about it. But why make up lies to get people to believe in your way of believing in Jesus? Only Jesus can do that. All of us are born in sin, but Jesus wasn't. Well, we spoke about this in our uh, last series. We spoke about this in our last series on the origins of Jesus. So, JR, please go back and it's only, what was it? Not that long ago. The origins of Jesus, a couple weeks ago, uh, we did a whole series on this kind of thing. How can Jesus be a fulfillment of David, David's son, the Messiah, the son of David, 
when it says that it must be a it must be a flesh and blood son of David from his loins. And all the rest of the Tanakh is always through. It, it tells us, all, all the rest of the Tanakh tells us about how God counts, counts it, Numbers chapter 1, counts it uh, through the uh, paternal lineage. Not through the mother, but the paternal line, lineage. Anyways, I'm getting, I know I'm getting too much into it here. But we already went into this whole thing. The doctrine of original sin is a doctrine that goes against the scriptures and common sense and any sense of justice for the sake of creating a, uh, making up a selling point for Jesus. And that in, in and of itself is also a lie. Because it's like only Jesus can do it. Only Jesus, only Jesus can obey the law. We, we're all sinners from, from says who? Jesus said, unless you become as the smallest of these little children, like one, like a newborn babe, you're never going to see the kingdom of heaven. Why did he say that? Because he knows the newborn, the, the smallest of children are innocent. They're sinless. Sinless. That's why. Because it's very clear throughout, this, throughout the, the law and the prophets that if you sin, you'll die. The soul that sins shall die. You have sin, you will die. In other words, no salvation. The just shall live by faith. That is the salvation thing. You, it, the righteous, the Sadiqs will live by amuna, faith. But the soul that sins shall die. What is sin? Very clear. First John three four. Sin is transgression of the Torah. That's sin. It's not some bloodline thing sin is transgression of the torah you do not have sin if you have never or you do not you do not have sin if you do not transgress the torah if you transgress the torah you have sin but if you do not transgress the torah you do not have sin can you can somebody explain to me how a newborn baby transgresses the torah please tell me how does a newborn baby transgress the torah what does a newborn baby do? Murder? Take the Lord's name in vain? What, is, what, is the, what does a newborn baby do? Bear false witness? What? What does a newborn baby do? That, that, that is sin. Yeah, newborn babies are sinless. Only Jesus can do this. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Well, again, uh, I'll bring this up. John 14, verse 12. According to John 14, verse 12, if you believe it, Jesus said, whoever believes in me will do what I have done and even greater th th than what I've done. So what does that mean? That means that the whole only Jesus thing is completely thrown out the window. Because Jesus himself said, that those who believe in him will do greater works than he, than he has ever done. According to John 14, 12. There goes that doctrine. Out goes the false doctrine. In comes the new doctrine. The true doctrine. Out goes the false doctrine. In comes the true doctrine. There's a lot to it, JR. There's a lot to it. I feel like I, I, I kind of hesitate to get into it because it's something that you, it, it, I, I, I can't do it justice just by saying this. All I can say is this. If you, if you, um, if you put aside preconceived ideas and the things that we've all heard before about original sin, if you, if you can do that, if you can read the passages and again, forget about Paul, because Paul has to line up with the Torah and the prophets. If he, if he doesn't, then he's, whatever he says is not right. If he says A or B or C, and it doesn't line up with the Torah and the prophets, then forget it. Where does it say in the Torah and the prophets that sin is, it, that, that we're all part of sin? Or we, that, we're, that we're all, um, that they're, like, they're original sin? Where does it say that? The 
As far as I know, it doesn't say that. That's why the, uh, the Jews who study the Tanakh, the, the Law and the Prophets, much more than any Christians do, generally speaking, the Jews who, who, that actually study this, they don't believe in original sin. You ask. Go, go find yourself a, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Go find yourself an, or, an Orthodox rabbi and ask him, excuse me, rabbi, do you believe in original sin? Is that true? You know what he's going to say? No, not even close. Not even, not even close to being true. That's what he's going to say. JR says, love God, keep his commandments. That earns you merited favor and grace. I wouldn't say that, okay, because I believe that we were created. Everything was cre- Before you even thought of, it's the grace of God that brought you here. Every breath you breathe, whether you are wherever, you, if you're alive, anybody who's alive, it's by the grace of God. Everything we do is by the grace of God. It's not that we follow his commandments to earn his grace. Rather, it's his grace that gives us the power to follow his commandments. It's his grace that actually gives us the ability to obey him. And the more righteous you are, the more of his Holy Spirit dwells in you. I wouldn't say that either. I wouldn't say that either. I think that the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes to, I don't think it's like a, well, how much of the Holy Spirit do you have today? Ah, 21%. I'll get on to 25% later. You know, it depends. Oh man, I messed up. I'm down to 15%. I better hurry up before I, I don't want to get to zero. Now, I, don't, I don't think that that's the, that's the case. Uh, in my own experience, when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit came in, in his fullness. Boom. It went from like zero to hundred percent done, you know? And you know, so I don't think it's a, thing like that. I think the Holy Spirit is, is, a, is a person. So, so it's like you know, it's like uh, if you have um, if you have somebody over f- to your place as a guest, it's like well, they're, I got like you know, 5% of them as a guest. <laughs> Well, maybe you do. I don't know. But you know what I'm saying. It's like they're either in or they're out, right? It's either the Holy Spirit's in or, or the Holy Spirit's out. That's, that's how I understand it. Thank you, JR. Seek the Lord says, thank you, brother. Thank you. Seek the Lord. Appreciate that. JR says, I'll search too. I wasn't sure. Thanks. I just want to understand so I can help others see it too. Well, thank you very much, JR. You know, um, come around more often. Check out the... the uh, the replays of the live stream, we, we, we spoke about this stuff a lot. All this kind of stuff. Thank you, JR. Appreciate that. God of One True Kings, enjoying, well, enjoying it. Thank you. Ch- uh, Kubert says, Shalom. Shalom, Kubert. Welcome. Blessings. Blessings multiplied to you. People want Yeshua and sin. The modern churchianity gives them, gives them the, we, the we all sin grace doctrine. True. Yep. We all sin, and the more sin we got, the more grace we get. And I think the more grace you get, the more the less sin you should have. Jr. says, "I wasn't trying to say you get a percentage more, more like you're in alignment with and in sync." Okay. I felt the Holy Spirit and I've felt it leave when I sinned. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, before, before, I, before I... See, I had an experience in, in 1992 in, in August in which I believe I was filled with the Spirit. I did not experience what a lot of people say, like, like this, you know, speaking in tongues and this kind of thing. No, it was just like powerful spiritual experience that nobody could, would know about except for me. I was alone. And it was very powerful, a life-changing experience. Before that, yes, I definitely felt the presence of God, per se. 
you know, in many ways, uh, in, you know, very powerfully. And this is the reason why I decided to leave a life of sin and, and, and follow him. But there was a time when I repented of everything that I could possibly repent of, given the knowledge that I had back in those days, and I invited him to come into me. You see, this is, this is it. When you repent of sin, according to Ezekiel 18, Deuteronomy 30, you know, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, when you repent of sin, God will look at you as if you've never, ever sinned, ever. And what I mean by repent, I mean change. I don't mean just feeling sorry or remorse or regret. I don't think that's repentance. I think repentance is actual change. Actual change. And this is what I did in August of 1992. Is to the best of my ability, an exhaustive flushing, if you will, of you know, heart, and, heart and mind of any kind of thing that's against, against the will of God in my life. And, uh, and that experience was just absolutely amazing. I never knew I was empty. I did not know I was empty before that. I, I, if somebody were to come up to me and say, oh, Christopher, you're empty. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'd, I'd probably ignore them or I, I would probably you know, argue with them. Oh, no, I'm not empty. I got the Holy Spirit. I feel the pre presence of God. I feel the Spirit. But I didn't. I didn't really have it until August of 1992. Then I knew that I had... <laughs> You know, because it's like, well, I never knew this was possible. I never knew this ever. Ex I didn't know that you could ever experience God like this. I didn't know that I was empty until I was filled. And then when I was filled, it's like, oh, I missed, like, I was empty all this time and I didn't even know it. I, like, literally, I didn't know any better. Okay. All right. So if you guys haven't already, please leave a like, subscribe, follow if you're new here. We do this every single day. Tomorrow we are going to be, Lord willing, we are going to have the band with us. We're going to be doing a new song. For those of you who are members, if you haven't seen it already in the in the community tab on, on the on my YouTube channel, uh, there I've already posted the lyrics to the to the new song. So you got it there. And just to give you guys some early access as a way of showing my gratitude for for you guys you guys are amazing you guys are awesome yes so if you haven't already please like if you're new subscribe we do this every single day twice a week so far we have a live band we always have live music almost always uh we have live uh keyboard beautiful beautiful heavenly peaceful keyboard music with uh hannah joins us every night uh, and twice a week so far, we have a band that comes in, uh, a band that plays, and uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful time, lots of fun. We we speak about the things of God. We think we we speak about the things of Scripture. We talk about Jesus, New Testament, first century history, all this kind of stuff. If you're interested in any of this kind of thing, uh, make sure you're subscribed or follow following. All right. Okay, let's talk about the appeal to popularity, and then we'll do our critical thinking quiz. The appeal to popularity is one of those what they call logical fallacies. It's it's an error in reasoning by some people. Let's pull this up here. Appeal to popularity, otherwise known as argumentum ad numerum. And this is from another website uh, called Logically Fallacious. Also see appeal to common belief. Description, using the popularity of a premise or proposition as evidence, as evidence for its truthfulness. This is a fallacy which is very difficult to spot because our quote-unquote common sense tells us that if something is popular, it must be good, true, valid. 
But this is not so, especially in a society where clever marketing, social and political weight, and money can buy popular. Logical form. Everybody is doing X, therefore X must be the right thing to do. Example number one. Mormonism is one of the fastest growing sects of Christianity today, so that that whole story is about Joseph Smith getting the golden plates that unfortunately disappeared back into heaven. Must be true. Explanation. Mormonism is indeed rapidly growing, but the fact does not, but that fact does not prove the truth claims made by Mormonism in any way. Example number two, a 2005 Gallup poll found that an estimated 25% of Americans over the age of 18 believe in astrology or that the, the position of the stars and planets can affect people's lives. That is roughly seven, 75 million people. Therefore, there must be some truth to astrology. Explanation. No, the popularity of the belief in astrology is not related to the truthfulness of, of astrological claims. Beliefs are often cultural memes that gets passed on from, from person to person based on many factors other than truth. Exception, when the claim being made is about the popularity or some related attribute that is a direct result of its popularity. For example, people seem to love the movie, the... Shawshank Redemption. In fact, in fact, it is currently ranked number one at imdb.com based on viewer ratings. Tip, avoid this fallacy like you avoid a kiss from your great aunt with a, with a big cold saw on her, on her lip. All right, so there you go. Avoid that fallacy. Okay. All right, all right. Yeah, JR says, such as everyone believes Paul is an apostle. Yeah, that's that's it. That's 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 exactly it right there. Just because everybody believes Paul is an apostle doesn't mean that he necessarily is. Now, that doesn't mean he isn't either, but it doesn't prove that he is. Okay, let's see what we got here for our critical thinking quiz for the night. All right, fill in the blank. Critical thinking quiz. Here we are. The same five letters can be rearranged into two separate words to fill in the blanks. The caveman shook a primitive sort of blank. It was too heavy to use against some of the faster animals, but it seemed to work against blank. And in each case, it's a five letter word. Once again, the same five letters can be arranged into two separate words to fill in the blanks. The caveman shook a primitive sort of blank. It was too heavy to use against some of the faster animals, but it seemed to work against blank. What do you guys think the answer is here? What do you guys think the answer is here?
JR says rattle or club off the bat, but neither fit the blanks. Okay. Well, it's a good try. You can try. Caveman shook a primitive sort of. It was too heavy to use against some of the faster animals, but it seemed to work against. All right, a little bit of a hint here. This word, this one here, this last word, is a slower, maybe not slow per se, but it's, it wouldn't be like the fastest of the large animals. Fast, but maybe not as fast as a. Some of the fastest of the animals. So it's a slower animal. They are says stick slash ticks, but not a slow animal. Yeah, I think you're, yeah, another, another good try. Another good try. Hubert says, sword rounds. I think crowds might be one letter too much there. JR was saying, I was going to say sword words, but words are not an animal. Yep. So the last word is animal. Is an animal. I'll give you guys another hint. Flo, Flo says spear asper. Spear asper. I'm not going to give I'll give you guys a few more minutes here before I give the answer. Would you like me to give the answer in at, all at once as in both words or one word at a time? Asper is a snake. Hubert says spear pears. JR says one word at a time. Okay, I'll give two more minutes and then I'll give you guys the answer. So JR wants me to give one word at a time. Is anybody is it, anybody there in the live chat, do you object to that? Do you want them both at once or do you want one, one word at a time? 
So if you object to, okay, so Qberts wants one word at a time as well. So we got two. Anybody object to that? Out of one true king says one word as well. So, okay, this is what we'll do. I'll, I'll, let me say this first. I'll say this first. Uh, Flo's, Flo's answer here is very, very good. Uh, I think that Flo uh, did an awesome job here uh, as this could work. This could work. This could be the right. The thing is here is that... Um, According to the book, the last word is is not Asper. Uh, however, again, I do have to say, I think Flo did an excellent job here. Really, really good. The first one that, that would, the first one of you guys that actually, okay, so you got like something that, that makes sense. You got something that sounds like it, it would be, it's right. So it's really good job, Flo. Excellent. However, the last word is not Asper, according to the book. Okay? I'll have to say this. According to the book, the last word is not Asper. The last word is bears. Bears. And so JR got that one. Bears for the last word. So what would the first word be? And I'm, you know what? I'm not going to say that Flo is wrong because I think that she, I think, I think Flo, you did a great job and that would work. So I would say this, this, this would work. This could be, I would say this is right. But according to the book, the last word is bears. So I think that this is something that That there could be more than one correct answer. Take the Lord says E bars. JR says saber. Then bears. You know what, JR? You you're correct. Yes. Calamento says saber. Yes. According to the book, that's what it is here. A saber and bears, but I do not want to. I do not know. In this, you know, I do not want to make it look like Flo is wrong because I think Flo did a really excellent job here, and what she said, it, I would say, is, is right as well. So, yeah. Um, let me do a. I'll do a copy and paste here from the. Copy and paste right from the book. So right from the book, this is what it has in here. Saber or saber with an RE and bears. Saber too. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is, so that's, that's it. That's what we got there. So, um, you guys are awesome. Flo, I'll, I'll give it to you. I mean, this is great. This is, this is an awesome, awesome uh, answer. I think that the author, even of the book, would probably say you're right as well. So, congratulations, Flo, for doing such a good job. And also, JR, awesome. And um, I know all of you, you did a great job, you know, really thinking hard on this one. and 
and uh, just awesome. Yeah, good job. Flo says, wow, good job, JR. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you, Flo. You did, you, you, both of you did a great job. All of you did. I know you're all thinking uh, pretty, uh, I, could, I could hear the, the gears turning. Randy says, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Randy. Blessings, blessings multiplied to you. So that'll be it for tonight. That'll be it for tonight. The audio cut out and I didn't hear it. I don't think anybody else had, did anybody else have that problem with the, the audio cutting out? Helemento says, great job, guys. You are too awesome. You're, you, you all are too awesome. You guys are awesome. Awesome guys. Awesome guys. Todd One True King says, good job, Flo. Qberts and everyone. Yes. Good job. Good job. JR says, cool. I got it. Yes. Awesome. Good stuff. Going Nowhere says, good night. Normally, I try to think of something lighthearted and wholesome to say, but I got nothing right now. No problem. Going Nowhere. Good to see you. Blessings. Have a great evening. Seek the Lord says, thank, thanks. Thank you. Seek the Lord. JR says, there's the audio. Okay. I'm not sure. I don't think anybody else had that. I don't think anybody else had that problem. I don't think it was on my end. Sorry, sorry to hear that you had problems there, JR, but good to know the, the audio's back. Flo says, thank you, Christopher. Great live stream tonight. See you all tomorrow. Really looking forward to the music. Thank you, Flo. Awesome. Blessings, blessings multiplied to you. Have a great night. Peaceful, wonderful night. And Seek the Lord says, thanks and God bless you, brother. Thank you, Seek the Lord. Blessings and shalom and peace multiplied back to you as well. Hubert says no. Okay, so it must have been something on JR's end for the audio. Okay, guys. Yes. So tomorrow, uh, I can tell you at least two songs that we're going to be singing. Okay. Uh, we are going to be singing a new song. Uh, and I'll let you guys, I'll, I'll sing it when, 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 we, when we do it, we'll do it. So it's going to be a surprise for some of you. Those, again, those of you who were members you can uh, you can actually go into the community tab and get a little bit more information as you guys have early access to the lyrics there and also um i know flo asked for the um let my people go so i'll do that as well we'll do that as well tomorrow lord willing everything goes as planned we'll do that as well as a few other songs as well and we're going to keep on doing our readings and q a fellowship critical thinking as well you guys are awesome. Flo says mine was good. Okay, thank you for letting me know. I appreciate that. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. You guys are world changers. Keep on keeping on. Keep on calling on him and he will show you great and mighty things. Think about it like as if we're like little children just watching dad, you know, do some mighty things and getting taught from, from the father as well. It's just absolutely amazing. Okay, love you guys. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen. Amen. I'll see you guys tomorrow.